welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Well, tonight uh, we're going to get into the Word of the Lord. Anybody excited about getting in the Word of God? Man, I'm excited too. I believe that God has given uh, a word to me to deliver to you. I'm just the mailman though tonight. I, I got to warn you, don't go to church to hear from a man or a woman. This is not about hearing from the the old, the black, the white, the brown, or any other color we could imagine. It's not about a tall man, short man, any of that kind of stuff. Come on, let's get off of that stuff. This is about us coming together and hearing from the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher of the church. So if you would honor the Lord in standing to your feet, I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord tonight together in prayer. Father, tonight we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus, our risen King. Lord, we are grateful, God, grateful for Jesus, grateful for the house of God where we can come and encounter your presence tonight, grateful that the Holy Spirit is in our midst, God. And Holy Spirit, tonight we would ask that you come and be our teacher, be our guide, give us the wisdom, the vision, the direction that each and every one of us need for our individual lives. God, we pray that as we open up your word, that you would open it up to us, open us up to receive it. Give us eyes that see and ears that hear and hearts that have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown and may it produce something that which you intended it to produce in each and every one of our individual lives. And Lord, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for that in Jesus' name. Lord, I just want to take this opportunity right now to pray for other churches. God, it's Easter week and there are so many churches all around the world, God, preaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that you bless them, God. I pray that they have a rich Easter week. God, starting tonight all the way through Sunday, Lord, with all the different church services, the adding of seats, God, I pray, Lord, that none be disappointed, God. I pray that there would be overflow in every church, God. I pray, Father God, for salvations. I pray that the lost would be compelled to come in to the house of God, Lord, that they would be found and that they would find you, God. I pray, Father God, that uh, you would just bring a special anointing upon all the churches, God. And Lord, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. God, we're excited about what's coming up this week, Father, and we're grateful for Jesus above all else. For it's in his mighty name we're all in agreement, we say, amen. amen. You can have a seat. Well, tonight, get your Bible out and go with me to the book of Matthew. And we're going to be in Matthew chapter number 26. But before we go to the word of the Lord, you know what? I'd like to welcome anybody who's here for the first time. I knew there was something I was forgetting. The ushers didn't even wave the cards at me this time. Cool, guys. There they are. Now they're waving it at me. They said, yeah, we did. You just weren't looking. Praise God. If it's your first time, just raise your hand. The ushers will get one of those cards down your direction. Also, we just want to welcome you and say hi, tell you that we love you a whole lot. All right, welcome back there. Anybody else here for the first time? A couple of you guys, welcome over here. Glad to have you with us over here. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome up here. Praise God. We're glad that you guys are here. As you open up that uh, brochure, uh, you'll notice that there's some basic information about the Roxham, who we are, what we do, that sort of a thing. Also, uh, church service times and things like that. You'll see a welcome card from our senior pastors, and uh, they love you. And, and uh, on the back side of that welcome card, there's a little black and white general information card. We would love for you to fill that out and do one of two things with that. You can either drop it in the offering bucket later on in church service as it goes by, and that's okay. That's just all right, though. You know what? The cool thing to do, take it to the left-hand side of the foyer. Back there, there's a CD counter. If you drop that card off, filled out. They'll give you a free copy of tonight's message. Or here's the cool thing. Remember I was talking about Pastor Deborah's message this weekend? Say, I want the good message from this weekend, and they'll drop that on you, okay? And uh, that'll bless your life, all right? Let's give them one more great big warm welcome. All right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now, Matthew 26. Tonight I want to talk to you about a message called Broken for Christ. Matthew chapter number 26. During this season of Easter, we turn our eyes onto Jesus Christ and on his sacrifice, and we take a look at the steps that he took towards the cross. Matthew chapter number 26, we're starting verse number 6, and read through verse number 13. Jesus has uh, now come into Judea, headed towards the Passover. Before that happens, we find something that takes place here in Matthew chapter 26, verse number 6. It says, and when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, verse 7, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil. And she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. Now, stop right there for a second. Bethany was uh, one of the stops along the way to Jerusalem. You find Jesus, he starts in Jericho, and he starts to make his ascent towards Jerusalem. Here in Bethany, he stops, and some of, some of the gospel accounts put this during the, the Passion Week, 
uh, Gospel of John puts it before, six days before the Passover. In, in any event, that doesn't really matter. What matters is, is that Jesus is making his way towards the cross. Here Jesus is on, on a journey, and everything that Jesus does speaks to us. Just like we saw this weekend that Jesus, even on the cross, in the words that he was saying, was speaking something, was teaching us something. So also we see just in Jesus' life, the fact that Jesus had gone from Jericho, a low point, an earthly point, a point where in the past had represented the worldly nations that fell before the praises of God as the children of Israel marched around Jericho and the walls came down. We see Jesus at that point... Now ascending on his way to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the heavenly city. It was the holy city. Jerusalem represented the kingdom of God. And so here Jesus is on his journey, and he stops midway through at a place called Bethany. There was something that he needed to do, something that needed to take place on his journey. So we find him at the house of a man by the name of Simon the leper. Now, we don't know if this was a man that Jesus had healed. Uh, once again, really, all we need to know is that he was at a house and they were having some dinner. What happened was, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask, remember verse 7, a very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. Uh, some of the other gospels record that she broke open this alabaster flask full of spikenard. And there she anointed his head, and the gospel of John records that also she took her hair and she wiped his feet. She lowered herself. She humbled herself. And for a woman to uncover her head and to let down her hair like that was undignified. It, it, it was something that people would have looked at and kind of went, ooh, what's she doing? You know, that sort of a thing. It, that's kind of out of order. That's, uh, that's inappropriate what she's doing there. Customary is that women should be there serving. Women should be kind of in the background. And yet this woman doesn't just come and anoint his head with a couple of drops, which would have been a nice gesture which would have been something that everybody would have said, hey, that was extravagant, that was wonderful that she did that. No, what does she do? She breaks open her vessel, and she pours it on his head and anoints him, and then humbles herself and wipes his feet. Reading on. Verse number 8. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? Why this waste? Now, me personally, I would have thought the disciples would have got the point by now. Here's Jesus. Anything spent on Jesus is not a waste. Anything spent on Jesus ha has got to be something well spent. And yet there was one man who was a greedy, one man who was a thief, who was over the, the money box by the name of Judas, who started yapping. Oh, this could have been sold and given to the poor. He's trying to look pious when, in fact, he really wanted to skim off the top. And it was customary at the Feast of Passover to give alms to the poor. And so he's trying to look like this custom, trying to look like this, this pious deed of giving to the poor is what he was really after. And yet, it's not what he's after. He's greedy. He wants to skim off the top and take for himself. And so the other disciples, maybe the fly in the ointment started to spoil the whole batch. And the other disciples start to say, well, why this waste? He's got a point. We could have given that money to the poor. We could have taken care of the needs of somebody. I mean, Jesus is cool. He's all right. I mean, he's, he's never had a problem. Sure, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests. He doesn't have a place to lay his head. But, I mean, Jesus has always had provision. Remember, we fished and we got the coin and we were able to pay our taxes, all that kind of stuff. Remember just Jesus, uh, you know, splitting open the bread and the fish. We've never had a lack of food. But there are people out there who need something. We could have sold that. Could have used that money. Why this waste? Verse number 9, for this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Verse 10, but when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. In other words, he starts to change their perspective now says, yeah, there, there could have been a good work done for the poor, and he's not belittling that at all. He says, but she's done something for me. Here, Jesus, the richest king that there ever was in eternity, humbled himself and made himself of no reputation. The Bible says he became poor. 
So he's not belittling the poor. No, what he's saying is, is that she's done something for me. She was on assignment, specifically doing something for me. Maybe she was aware of it. Maybe she wasn't. Maybe she was just pouring something out, pouring out her heart, giving an offering or a sacrifice, not even knowing that what she was doing was part of the plan of Jesus' life. Verse 11, for you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. In other words, there's always an opportunity. Listen, the poor will always be there, and you'll always have an opportunity to do good. See, he wasn't belittling the poor. He was saying, you're going to have more opportunity with them. But this opportunity that's right here in front of you is not going to be with you always. Take advantage of what's here and now right in front of you. Verse 12, for in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Wow. See, the disciples would have said, oh, if it's for you, Jesus, if there's a purpose, if there's a plan, if this is a part of the process, then, then yes, we'll do that. Just like Jesus sent them to go untie the colt, full of a donkey, bring it to him. They saw the purpose. They saw the plan. They knew that Jesus was going to ride in. Maybe they even remembered the prophecy of that taking place. And so they readily did it. But here, they weren't involved in it. Here, all they saw was excess and extravagance and waste. And they saw a missed opportunity in the wrong place. Verse 13, Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world... What this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. I think any of the disciples, with all of their musterings and arguments about who is the greatest, would have loved to have had that statement made about them. That anywhere the gospel is preached all over the world, worldwide, you're going to be remembered. They would have said, absolutely, I'll do it. I'll do whatever you want. If that's the reputation, that'll prove, that will solidify my greatness. And then I can lord that over the other 11 guys, right? And yet now here they are eating humble pie because they were mad at the woman a second ago, but now Jesus is saying, oh, no, she's going to be remembered all over the world for all time, wherever this gospel is preached going to be told as a memorial to her. It's interesting to me, throughout the Bible, you find that there's a collection of stories, a collection of ideas about broken things. God collects broken things. It's interesting. In the Old Testament, you'll find broken pottery. In the New Testament, in the Gospels, you'll find broken nets. Each of them speaking to our lives. Here in this story, we find a broken vessel, a broken alabaster flask that held very costly oil. And God keeps this image contained in Scripture for thousands of years to speak to us. Wow. Now, this vessel that we see represents a life. And it represents a sacrifice. And it speaks not only of the sacrifice of the woman, but it ultimately points to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Think of it for a second. If that life was a vessel, and that vessel was very costly, that vessel had come from a long ways away. See, spikenard actually came from a root of a plant all the way in East India. So in those days, to get from East India over to Jerusalem was quite a journey. Maybe boat, maybe camel, maybe walking. See, they didn't have airplanes, they didn't have trains, and they didn't have automobiles. And so it was a longer journey to get this, and so it was very costly to get a hold of this. In fact, uh, some scholars have calculated it, that it was a year's worth of wages. Can you imagine taking your salary, going down to the perfume store, there in the perfume store, you've got all of the different brands, and they're spraying everything all over the place. You're having an uh, asthma allergy attack from all of the different scents and fragrances. And finally, they pull out this beautiful ivory jar, and they say, this is actually the most expensive thing in the whole store. 
but it's going to cost you one year of your wages. I think we would probably say, um, I'll take that stuff that made me sneeze, right? <laughs> and yet this woman takes this, something that could have bought her a lot of stuff. Years worth of wages, my goodness, how far would that go? What could that buy? What could that do? She could have used it for herself. I mean, maybe there was a wedding day coming up. Maybe she could have used that to, to present herself to her husband. Maybe that, that, that scent and that fragrance could have lasted and been a special thing for them. See, what could she have done with what she had? And yet, she took what she had that represented her life. It represented a year worth of wages, hard work, effort, energy, blood, sweat, and tears. And so here she is, and she takes what she has... And she breaks it. And she doesn't just drip a little bit on Jesus. See, customarily at a, at a feast, it would have been an honor to just drip a couple little drops on the honored guest. That would have been an honor for the guest as well as for the person doing that. Everybody would have said, good job. Good on you. Hey, that's great that you did that. No, she breaks it open. Get an image of her just like taking it and cracking it on the chair leg or something like that, you know, just busting it open or taking a knee, you know, and splitting it like a baseball bat, doing something, you know, just, just something that's awkward, something that everybody's kind of wondering, what is she doing over there in the corner? You know what I mean? Because it, 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 it just doesn't fit the scene of Jesus reclining at the table. Here's Simon. Here's the disciples. They're all kicking back, having a good time. He's kind of relaxing, and, 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 and he's not in the public eye right now. And so Jesus is able to sort of, uh, you know, just take a breath, take a moment. Here he is relaxing. And all of a sudden, this awkward woman comes in who's, who's got something that's obviously very costly, and everybody's going to notice it because it's out of the ordinary. And there she is, and she breaks it. And she dumps it on his head. It's a sacrifice. It's undignified. It's extravagant. See, Jesus in the same way was the king of glory. Jesus in the same way disrobed himself of his glory, which he had with the Father in heaven, he came down into our room, earth side. Here the king of glory walked among us. And at times it may have seemed awkward when Jesus came on the scene. Demons shrieking, convulsing people on the ground, foaming at the mouth, people running to him, thousands shouting at him, coming around him, thronging him. He had to teach from a boat sometimes instead of on the land. The places he would show up, he'd go to somebody's house and there'd be so many people that they were all outside the house looking in any way they could. And because people couldn't get to him, they had to dig through the roof. See, it, it got a little awkward sometimes when Jesus came around because things got a bit crazy. Things got a bit out of the ordinary. Things got a bit undignified at times. And often the people that we would have thought Jesus would have wanted to go and talk to, the influencers... The high rollers. We would have thought Jesus would have been talking to the government. We would have thought Jesus would have been talking to Herod and Pontius Pilate and, and the leaders of the synagogue. And yet oftentimes when he talks to those people, it's a bit awkward. You brood of vipers, you snakes. Oh my goodness, Jesus. You just offended them, and yet he doesn't care. Why? Because he says the prostitutes and the tax collectors are entering the kingdom of heaven before you guys. And Jesus, with his love, was undignified and extravagant. He went out of his way. He got into places that we, should, we thought he shouldn't have gone. He ate with sinners. My goodness, what's he doing? And then eventually, here he is on a Roman cross. The ultimate insult the occupying nation as well as the worst way to die recorded in history the most gruesome the most painful and yet jesus broke open his life poured it out on us humbled himself to serve wow tonight what is this speaking to us today here we are in 2013. Here we are looking at Passion Week, looking at the week where Jesus is going to the cross. Here we are with our jobs, 
with our families, with our present day problems and trials, things that we're going through. And yeah, they may not seem like these problems that we see. There may not be a Roman army coming after us. May not be anybody shouting at us, crucify him, even though we might feel like it on the inside. And yet, what is God speaking to us today? See, there's a, a, a life that we have to live in response to the word of God. And as we approach the word, it's not just a story. It's not just a, a history lesson. This is not just something contained so that we know what happened no, we're to look at the life of Christ, and Jesus Christ is speaking to us here and now and tonight and wants to tell us something. Because this not only points to the woman's sacrifice, not only points to the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ, but points to our lives broken for Christ. Now our lives are in Him. And now He's living out His life in and through us. See, there is a life of sacrifice that we're called to. Jesus said, I want you to take up your cross and follow me. So that same ascent from Jericho to Jerusalem, we are making earth side to heaven side as we live out our lives. And as we stop at Jesus, we are going to have to make a sacrifice. There's a point where we're going to have to pour out our lives and open up what we are, and we're going to have to make it cost something in our lives. It's going to have to be felt by us. Oh, it may not just be a year's wages. Maybe it's more than that. Maybe it's your, your dignity. Maybe that's a bigger thing to you because of your pride. I know I have to check myself constantly. I thank God my wife is like the pride checker in my life. You know, she's like, oh boy, you better stop that. Yes, ma'am. Sometimes it is finances. Sometimes it's time. Sometimes it's doing things we don't want to do. Sometimes it's being viewed by others where we take on ridicule, misunderstanding, bringing your Bible to work. Telling your neighbor about Jesus. God has called us to live a life of sacrifice. So tonight I want to take a look at what our sacrifice is. There's a couple of things that I see in the story that can help us on our journey, that can help us on our road to following Jesus Christ. I'm going to make this statement and complete it a couple of times tonight. Our sacrifice is, we'll make that statement and, and complete it a couple of times to find out what it looks like to be broken for Christ. Our sacrifice is, number one, motivated by love. Number one thing is that our sacrifice is motivated by love. Now, we know that God loves all of humanity. But there are people recorded in the Bible that specifically the Bible says that Jesus loved. The Apostle John was one of them, okay? John was even called the disciple whom Jesus loved. When John writes his disciple, he says, he doesn't even call himself me or I or any that kind of stuff. He says, the disciple whom Jesus loved was reclining at the table, leaning on his chest, the disciple whom Jesus loved was following Peter, right? And, and Peter turned around and said, what about him? See, there might have been a little jealousy there. Because all these disciples were saying, who's the greatest? And yet John's going, this is the disciple whom Jesus loved. <laughs> Y'all can be the greatest, but I'm the loved one. <laughs> See, and there's special favor that goes along with that position. You remember the disciples were wondering what Jesus was talking about when he was talking about his betrayal. What did they do? They said, psst. John, hey, you're leaning up against Jesus. He loves you. You ask him, right? <laughs> kind of like that guy that you know has favor with the boss. You say, hey, you know what? I wanted to ask the boss about this idea that I had, but I think it'd be better coming from you. Why you say that? Because you think they have favor. So what they're doing is they're saying, John, we know Jesus loves you. So we want you to go and ask him. A couple other people. In the Bible, specifically, that it says that Jesus loved. One of them was named Martha. You remember Martha was a servant. Martha was the one who was busy with so many things, right? Martha was also the one who had a brother named Lazarus. Lazarus died, and Jesus raised him from the dead. But before Jesus raised him from the dead, they called for Jesus. You know what the Bible records? It says that they called him, and they said, Lord, he whom you love is sick. Now, see, we would have thought, well, Jesus loves everybody. But they knew that there was a special relationship that if they said, Lazarus, yeah, that's, Lazarus is sick, okay, I get that. But no, they didn't. They said, Jesus, he whom you love is sick. What are they doing? They're tugging at his heartstrings. Lord, we know you love him. Therefore, come. And it says, so he stayed a couple more days where he was. Why? Because he knew what was going to take place. He knew the glory of God that was going to be revealed. 
The last one that we see is a lady by the name of Mary. Mary was Martha's sister. Mary was the one sitting at the feet of Jesus listening to his word. The one who chose the needful thing. Mary's the one who, when Jesus came and called for her, came and ran to Jesus, and when she saw him, fell at his feet. And this same Mary is the same Mary in John chapter number 12, who is anointing Jesus there at his feet, anointing them with oil and wiping them with her hair. This lady just loved the feet of Jesus, was always at his feet. It's no wonder we see that Jesus loved her. Now, oftentimes, we may look at that and we say, well, why did Jesus just love them and not everybody else? But can I submit something to you? Jesus does love everybody else. Is God a respecter of persons? No, not at all. So that means that I could go to God and I could say, God, the disciple whom you love is here. Is that right? John chapter 3, verse 16, let's put it up on the overhead. For God so loved just a few certain people that he chose. Is that what it says? For God so loved the select few. No, no. For God so loved what? Oh, come on. You guys have quoted this verse since you were babies. For God so loved what? The world that he gave his only begotten son. See, God has an extravagant love that he did not withhold. The Bible says he didn't even withhold his own son from us. My goodness, what is it that we have asked of God that he has held back? Nothing. God did not even withhold Jesus. And so when we come to him with our provision, when we come to him with our, 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 our physical frailties and weaknesses and sicknesses and things like that, we come to him with our, 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 our questions and our, and our anxieties and our fears and our frustrations. And the Bible says that God loves us. God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so here God is saying, I love the entire world. I love everyone. And we have that same privilege to say, God, I'm the one that you love. Why? Because I can prove it right there in the word. And say, but I, 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 I just don't feel it. Well, it doesn't matter if you feel it or not. You are loved. Regardless of how you feel, you're loved. I don't see it. Well, it's time to start looking. Time to open your eyes. Time to start seeing. Hey, start at the cross. That right there proves his love. Should silence every question that you have about whether or not God loves you. God laid down his life for you. Jesus said, greater love has no man than this than that he laid down his life for his friends. Wow. So what is it about these people that made them specifically noted in the word? Ah, glad you asked the question. When we were uh, getting ready to go to Bible college, we took a trip. And there, uh, we, we were over there for a couple of days. And while we were there, we had a, a friend of ours who was a pastor at the time uh, at this church that had uh, took us there and was showing us around, kind of showing us the ropes, helping us find an apartment, helping us find a job and things like that. And they had known some of the, the faculty there at the school we were going to. And so they were kind of taking us around. We were having a good time with them and, and just really enjoyed that time. I actually remember that time with, with some fondness. And there was a period of time where we asked them, hey, do you miss your children? Because they have three children. And, uh, and the dad, you know, sitting up in the front seat with a very authoritative voice says, yeah, I miss my middle son. Now, remember, he has three kids. And, and we're sitting there thinking, why not the other two? And so I don't know if it was Pastor Jess that asked or somebody asked, and they said, well, why, don't you miss, why do you miss him, you know? And he's right back immediately, because he misses me. <laughs> and now being a parent of three children myself, I understand this, because I have three children, and they, they, I love them all dearly. But my little guy right now is on a kick. You know what it is? You could be in the middle of yelling at him because he has just made a mess of everything. He's been defiant, all that. He's ripped everything to pieces, and, and, and now you're, you're disciplining him. And right in the middle of it, he'll just stop and get those big kind of cat eyes and just, Daddy, I love you. <laughs> and I could be mid-sentence like, you don't ever do. I love you too, son. <laughs> Come here and give Daddy a hug. Putting him to bed at night. Okay, kids, time to be quiet. Time, shh, it's night, night time. 
Daddy, I love you. Oh, my son, I just love you. See, why? Because it's reciprocated. See, our sacrifice for Jesus shouldn't be a burden. Shouldn't be something that we do because we have to. No, we get to. Why? Because we're motivated by love. Here's Mary coming into Jesus. Here's Mary who had sat at his feet and heard his word. Here's Mary who had such a relationship that they, they could tell, tell him and call him and say, hey, the one whom you love is sick. Here's Mary who her brother dies and is in the grave for four days. Jesus comes and raises him from the dead. And now out of a grateful heart and out of a motivation of love, she comes and she takes the most expensive, most costly thing that she has, something that she may never get back. And she breaks it open and she pours it out on him. Why? All for love. All because of a loving heart, a loving attitude. In our lives, we need to realize that expense and reputation is no consideration when sacrificing for the one we love. See, the Apostle Paul said, I will spend and be spent. When, when I get to heaven, I want to have just used up and, and, and just completely just spent everything that I had in the reserves for Jesus Christ. I don't want to have one penny left over in my pocket when I get to heaven. You understand I'm speaking figuratively. I don't believe we can take anything with us. But spiritually, I want to use up every last resource. I, I want to go out there and I want to win for the Lamb the reward of His suffering. Why? Because I'm motivated by love. Because I know God will take care of me. Because I know that He loves other people and wants to pour that out on them too. <laughs> See, some people say, well, I'm saving it. There's a difference between hoarding and saving. Just like there's a difference between sacrifice and waste. The disciples said, this is a waste. But she was motivated by love, and Jesus said, she's done a beautiful thing for me. So it's not wasteful, it's beautiful. It's not excess, it's the right thing at the right time. Second thing, our sacrifice is number two, a work of faith. We cannot live a life that pleases God without faith. We can love and be loved, but we have to do it in faith. And so this sacrifice that we're going to make, it has to be a work of faith. It has to be something that even though we may not understand it in the natural, that we see it in the spiritual. See, I believe that this was a premeditated thing, that, that she knew that Jesus was sitting there, and maybe it was that as she was staring at him at the table and helping her sister serve, that she was looking at Jesus, and she said, you know what, I've got something for him. I know it was reserved for me, but you know what? I, I, I want to give it to him. I believe that that motivation, that love so moved her that she went by faith and grabbed a hold of that thing and broke it out and poured it on him and just opened it up and just dumped it on him. Maybe that Mary had heard Jesus saying that he was going to the cross. Remember, she, she sat at his feet. She heard his word. The disciples had heard this for, for a long time. There were several times Jesus said the Son of Man is going to Jerusalem to be betrayed and he will hang on a cross. I'm going to die. Strike this temple down. I will raise it up in three days. They had ample opportunity. In fact, at one point, Jesus gets the disciples' attention, right? He's just cast a demon out of somebody and he gets the disciples' attention amidst all of this kind of, you know, uh, uproar and, and there's all this loud stuff going on. He gets their attention. He says, guys, 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 let this word sink down into your ears. My goodness, when I read that, I had the fear of God on me. What's he about to say? Sink down into your ears. And he says, the Son of Man will be betrayed into the hand of the Gentiles. See, they had ample opportunity to understand this and to know what was going to take place. They had ample opportunity to know that Jesus was going to Jerusalem. And the reason why he was going was that he was going to be betrayed and going to be crucified. He was warning them all the way up. Now, Mary may have heard this several times. And in hearing this, she might have said, he's going to die. If he dies at the hand of the Romans, he's going to die as a criminal. Therefore, he's not going to receive the ceremonial burial and anointing that he normally would. I need to anoint him. Could have been, okay? That's just a thought. That's not recorded in scriptures. So don't go out of here saying, Pastor Dan said, I didn't say it, okay? <laughs> just some thoughts. Because her motivation was love, but her work was done by faith. 
And therefore, when she came to him and she broke this thing open, now she pours it out on him. And now by faith, she anoints him for his death. And the reason why we know that is because Jesus records it. Remember what he said there in verse number 12 of Matthew chapter 26. It says, for in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. It doesn't say she knew she did it for my burial. But sometimes when you're operating in faith, you don't even know what you're doing. All you know is, I've got the word of the Lord on this. All you know is God said. I had a friend one time recounted a story to me. He said that, uh, you know, he was just praying and, and just believing God in some areas. And, and he said, God, I want to be used by you. And God said, I want you to go down to the corner store and buy a bag of donuts. And he said, get behind me, Satan. And he said, God, okay, please speak to me. And, and, and for, for five days, he prayed this prayer. And all five days, he heard the Spirit of God speak to him. I want you to go down to the corner store and buy a bag of donuts. Finally, on the fifth day, he said, I know it's just me. I know it's just my flesh. But just to get rid of this, I'm going to the corner store. I'm going to buy a bag of donuts, and we're going to have an end to this. So he goes to the corner store. He buys the bag of donuts. He got there first. He gets all of his favorites, right? And as he gets all of his favorites in there, he walks outside, and he's got a bag of donuts. He says, okay, Lord, if it's you, show me. And he's standing there. After a while, a woman drives up in, in her car. She has a little boy with her, and they race inside the store. He watches her pass by, doesn't think anything of it. She comes back out. He reaches into his bag of donuts, pulls out a maple bar, and he says, ma'am, Jesus loves you, and he hands her the maple bar. woman breaks down in tears completely a mess. He's thinking, oh my goodness, she must really not like maple bars. <laughs> Should have got the glazed. She composes herself. She says, I'm so sorry. I, I, this must seem ridiculous, but uh, you don't know what you've just done. And he says, you're, you're right. I don't know what I've just done. She says, see, um, my, my son here, uh, about a week ago, my husband left me. We were praying that he would come back. And my son has been uh, just devastated about it. And, and I asked him if there was anything I could do for him about a week ago. And he said, Mom, will you get me a maple bar? So I drove down and there were no maple bars. Next morning, I asked him, is there anything I can do for you? He said, uh, can you give me that maple bar? So she drove to the store. There was still no maple bar. She'd gotten there too late and people had already bought them. And she says, last night, my son and I were praying before bed. And we were praying for his daddy to come back. And as we were praying, he prayed for his daddy, but he also prayed, God, I pray that there would be a maple bar for me there. <laughs> she says, but then I prayed. I said, God, we've been believing for my husband. If there's not a maple bar there, I'm giving up. And now here she is, and here's this man who looks at her, motivated by love, but working in faith, with a maple bar saying, Jesus loves you. My goodness, sometimes we don't know what we're doing. Abraham went out not knowing where he was going. All he had was a word from the Lord. Here we find this woman. We don't know if she knew what she was doing or not, but she was making a sacrifice and making it by faith. We have opportunities presented to us every day to put our faith to work. See, we, we've got great teaching, especially in the United States. We've got the Word of God in multiple translations. We've got it on our smartphones We've got it. Uh, we can play it audio. We can send it by text. We can tweet our verse of the day. All of that kind of stuff. But when the rubber meets the road, the question is, are you motivated by love? And are you working out that word in faith? James chapter 2, verse 22, for time's sake, I'll just put it up on the overheads. It says this. It says, do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. See, it's one thing to say, I believe the word of God. Quite another thing to go out there and do what it says. But faith without works is dead. That means that it stops short of what it really should be. That means it's not going to get the job done. That means it's incomplete. But faith working together with works. See, this woman believed in Jesus. Believed in his authority. Believed he was the son of God. Had seen his miracles has sat at his feet and heard his word, and now here she is responding in faith with her works, no matter the cost, to her monetarily, or in her reputation. Now here she is breaking it open and pouring it out on Jesus by faith, 
not knowing potentially what she was doing. Now Jesus said, she did it for my burial. Now she understands. Now she has that aha moment. Now she says, I see. I see the result. I see what I did that for. Now her faith is made perfect. In the Bible, oftentimes you see perfect. Really what it means is complete, fully furnished, that it's equipped to accomplish what it was sent forth to do. When you partner up your faith, motivated by love, and you start to work out what it is that God has called you to do, now you're complete. Now you're equipped. Now you've got what it takes. You've got what you need. We can serve and sacrifice, or we can be stingy and steal. See, there's two things presented to us. You see one side, here's a woman who was serving. Here's a woman who was sacrificing. But then here were the disciples being stingy. Why this waste? And then we see Judas who was stealing. We say, well, I would, I would never steal from God. But you know what? There's often times that we see this in the natural, right? You get a job and they tell you, if you slack on company time, that's like stealing. And yet we don't apply this to what the Word of God says, that you were bought with the price and you're not your own anymore. And when God puts you on assignment and says, I want you to work this out and do this in your life, if you're not doing it, the Bible says everything that does not come from faith is sin. You're stealing company time. He who does not do the good that he knows he should, to him it is sin. See, there's a lot of people that say, oh, don't do anything. You don't have to do it. It's all by faith. It's all in the completed works of Jesus Christ. Absolutely yes and amen when it comes to our righteousness and our standing with God and our spiritual placement and authority. But when it comes to us here in the natural realm, we've got to get out there and do something. We've got to go and preach to somebody for them to hear and believe and receive Jesus. We've got to give in order for something to happen on the earth realm. No one's going to get fed. The poor will not be encouraged. Nothing's going to take place unless we get to work, church. So we've got to partner up our faith with our works. Our sacrifice, number one, is motivated by love. Number two, it's a work of faith. Last thing for tonight, our sacrifice is an enduring offering. Our perspective often is only on today. We look at a year's wages and say, there's no way I can spend that. There's no way I can afford that. And yet if we knew that it was something for Jesus and that it was something eternal, and we looked to tomorrow rather than looking at the need of today, all of a sudden our lives would change. We would do things differently. We need to recognize that we're always sowing, whether in word or in deed. Everything that you do is a seed, and you're constantly sowing. Sowing encouragement, sowing grace, sowing goodness, sowing finances, sowing blessings, sowing love, sowing into the future generations, sowing into your home, to your business, to the people around you. You're always sowing. And when you realize that there's a harvest coming, that there's something, that there's a, a, a crop or that there's a, an outcome, something that's going to take place because of what you have done, then all of a sudden it changes why you do what you do. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, once again, I'll just put it up on the overheads for you. It says, for God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. See, God is not oblivious to what you do. God is not oblivious to what you're doing in faith. God knows everything that's taking place. The Bible says all, everything's open before him. We're going to have to give an account to him, yes, but it's all open. God sees it all. God knows it all. And God is not on Prozac. He's not worried. God doesn't see you sacrificing and say, oh, my goodness, I don't know what they're going to do. They shouldn't. What a waste. No, God says there is a heart. There is a life. And what you do here on the earth, when you do it in Christ Jesus, it has an eternal reward. It has an eternal impact. It has an eternal return into your life. See, here's a woman who broke open her life, poured it out on Jesus Christ, had a purpose, anointed him for his burial. And what does Jesus say? Verse 13 of Matthew 26. It says, Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Wow. My goodness. See, every translation of the Bible has this story. And everywhere this gospel has been preached, when they preach this gospel, now it's told that there was a woman who came and broke open very costly fragrant oil, poured it on Jesus. I love how the book of John says that the fragrance of that perfume filled the whole room. See, you couldn't get away from it. Her good work did something. It changed the atmosphere. It, it, it changed the perspective of people. It, it caught the attention of the master. Mary's sacrifice was a picture of Christ. 
The sacrifice of Jesus Christ has an ongoing influence. Thousands of years later, the blood still is enough. Thousands of years later, the sacrifice is more than enough. Thousands of years later, only Jesus Christ makes a difference in our lives. Now remember, let's get a picture of this. Because here's a woman that for thousands of years, wherever the gospel has been preached, has been, as a memorial to her, been told what she's done. Here's Jesus Christ, everywhere the gospel is preached, is told what he's done. Did you know that what you do in Christ Jesus has an influence? It changes the atmosphere, and it will be remembered by God. I don't care if my name's written on the earth. The earth is going to burn. I want my name written in heaven. I want my name written where it lasts. Uh, I want my works to be recorded in a place that is going to be remembered. And when the books are open, may it be said of the Rock Church and World Outreach Center and the saints of God here on the earth that we were motivated by love, that we worked in faith, and that it has an enduring result. question for us tonight is what will we break open and pour out on Christ for his purpose? Will we break open our lives? Will we broke, break open our money? Break open our time? Break open our interest and our effort? Break open our compassion? Will we take the fruit of the Spirit and not hoard it but use it? Will we see the opportunities in front of us each and every day? See, we're not putting in an extra effort just for a holiday. It's not about Easter. This is not just about, you know, oh, it's just that time of year, so we need to, you know, build a set and do something extravagant and have videos and songs and dances and all that kind of stuff. No, no, no. If that's all it's about, let's shut the doors. But this is about eternity. And when we break open our lives and put in that extra effort, it's not for the holiday. No, this is for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We spend in sacrifice because we live in Him and He lives in us. Motivated by love, working in faith, and enduring offering, let's yield to the Spirit, living the life of Christ in and through us. Co-labor with Him. Work together with Him. Work hard at it, but let your motivation be love and realize and recognize that it has an enduring result. If you got something for the Word tonight, come on, give God a great big praise. Hey, I want to talk to some of you guys before you leave. I want to make sure that your heart's right with God before you leave this place. I want to make sure that if you were to die tonight, God forbid that should happen to anybody in this room. But the reality is, is that it could happen to any of us at any time. A friend of mine, his brother-in-law just passed at 39 years of age. Unexpected. They weren't planning on it. Didn't know it was going to happen. Came suddenly. And so I want to talk to you guys and want you to realize the reality that we're all facing. We're all one breath away from eternity. I want to make sure that you would go to heaven and that you wouldn't end up in hell. Listen, none of us in this room want to go to hell. It's a very real place, a terrible place. God doesn't want you to go to hell. I don't want you to go to hell either. Tonight, I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. And so we're going to have to face eternity. I want to ask you a question. I want you to just answer this question in your heart. No one will know the answer but you and God. What makes you think you're going to heaven? Oftentimes, people don't think they're going to hell. They either deny its existence, but it's in the Bible, so you're going to have to face it. Or they say, well, all roads lead to heaven, but nowhere in the Bible does Jesus say, hey, all roads lead to heaven, just do whatever you want. No, he doesn't say that at all. He does say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Can't get there your way, my way, some well-meaning church committee's way. We're going to have to get there God's way. Sometimes people say, well, I, I get that because I'm going to get to heaven God's way, and I think I'm going to go to heaven because I've been a good person, done a lot of good deeds throughout my lifetime. Used to be bad, cleaned up my act, now I'm good, and God lets good people into heaven. Again, the problem with that statement is that nowhere in the Bible does it say that God lets good people into heaven. I don't, I don't find any grading scale or curve or line that you have to be above, be this good, you get to go to heaven. There, there's no amount of goodness, do this many good deeds, and God will let you into heaven, or do more good than bad, and if your good outweighs the bad, then I guess God's good, and he'll let you in. It doesn't say that at all. You're not going to get to heaven just by being good. Sometimes people think, well, you know what? I was raised in church. Parents told me we were Christians growing up. Maybe they hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck, had you baptized or christened as a child, took you to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. And, and you were raised in America. America is a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religion. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindu. 
Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible say be raised in church, parents tell you you're a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible say wear religious jewelry, be baptized or christened as a child, or go to religious classes, or even be born in America. I don't see anywhere it says everybody in America goes to heaven. It doesn't work like that. And again, nowhere, nowhere, check it out, check it out. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're not some other religion that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying hell. It doesn't work like that. Come on tonight. Let's love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Some of you would say, well, pastor, not only when I was a child did I go to church, but here I'm sitting in church right now, and I consider myself to be a Christian. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? It's not there. It's like saying you could go down to Dodger Stadium, wear the Dodger uniform, bring your bat and your ball, sit in the dugout, call yourself a Dodger, and think that you're going to get to play in the game. You know what's going to happen? They're going to find you sitting there, drag you out, and mock you up. Why? Because you're not a Dodger. You can't sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. Sometimes people say, well, you know what? Not only have I attended church, but my last church I got involved. I sang in the choir for a number of years, helped out, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions. People thought of me as a leader. Uh, you know what? I, I even got a membership card to that church. It's great. I'm glad you did those things. Just show that to me in the Bible, could you, where your church involvement gets you into heaven? It's not there. Nor in the Bible say, help out, sing in the choir, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader. You teach in the Bible classes or get your membership card that God is looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter the gates of heaven. Listen, it's not going to make it. You say, but I know God. And somebody told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know God. I know about Jesus, celebrate Easter and the resurrection every year of my life, sing the songs at Christmas. I could even quote scriptures to you. You quoted John 3, 16 tonight, Pastor. I knew that one. I could also quote Old and New Testament scriptures to you. That's great. I'm glad you can do those things, but just show that to me in the Bible, can you? Where you know who God is. That gets you right with God. Celebrate a holiday or can quote some scripture. Have you read your Bible? The Bible says demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible records the devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and quotes scriptures, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. This is not about some mental ascent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God, headed for heaven and denying hell. But rather, this is about your heart. Here's the real question tonight. Have you given God all of your heart, and have you given God all of your life? If not, then I love you enough to tell you the truth tonight. You're not gonna make it. But hey, let's not leave you there. I wanna make sure that you recognize and understand that there's an opportunity right now being presented to you. Remember, we talked about opportunities. There's an opportunity for you to give God all of your heart and to give God all of your life tonight. Jesus called it being born again. He said, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again. Now, I know a lot of times our society makes a mockery out of that term. They, they make it out into this weirdo, fanatical, crazy type thing. And yet, Let's not look to the world to find out what being born again is. What does the Bible say about being born again? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means just what we described, that you've given God all of your heart, that you've given God all of your life. All or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, third chapter. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what is he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out, a little up, little down, a little token prayer every now and then, and occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything, and you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, you better look out. Why do I say that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, your call, your choice. Will you give them all of your heart? Will you give them all of your life? In a moment, I'm going to do this. I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. Bang. Pop my hands together. Would you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that? Bang. That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. It's just that easy. You say, but pastor, if I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh. You might be. Get over that embarrassment. Why? Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Come on tonight, a moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity away from God? No, you're not that dumb. But the devil thinks you are, and he's going to try and talk you out of it tonight. Flesh is going to try and hold you back. Push past that. 
Come on, it may seem undignified. It may seem like it's too extravagant, but like that woman who broke open the spike guard. Man, you can break open your life for Jesus and start it out by simply raising your hand and acknowledging your need for Jesus tonight. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all your heart and life? Come on tonight, I'm speaking to you. Finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can get right with God. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching my television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online. Get ready to get your hands up. God is watching. And then you can tell an usher right afterwards you're coming in the church service. Count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one. There's two. There's three. There's four. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? There's five and six. Thank you. God bless you. Six wise people already. Anybody else real quick? Six, seven. Got you up there uh, on this side. Seven. Back in that family room. Eight. Got you. Is there another one? Just one in the family room? Just one? All right. Nine. Got gotcha. you. Praise the Lord. Where are you at? Number 10? Number 10? Oh, way up there. Got gotcha. you, number 10. Thank you. 11 up top. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? Didn't already see? Back that way? Anybody else? Where are you at? Where are you at? Just pop it up high. Wave it at me if I don't already see you. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else real quick? Going for God tonight. Where are you at? Number 12? Number 12, you're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, you should. Come on, go for it. Go for it. I didn't embarrass them, and I won't embarrass you. Anybody else? Come on, number 12. You know God's tugging at your heartstrings. If that's you, come on. Come on, God's speaking to you right now. Just respond in faith. Let me see your hand. Anybody else? Thank you, number 12. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand for 12 wise people. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. All right. All 12 of you, or if you're number 13, number 14, number 15, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, a Bible, a friend if you need a friend. I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front. No one leaves during this time. Come on, that's just rude. But we're going to let them come forward right now so that they can receive Jesus. So if that's you, you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. Let's stand and welcome them. You come right now. Just make your way to the front. Come on. Come on. Come on. Jesus, I believe. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. You're the reason that I live. The reason that I breathe. Jesus, I breathe. You can come too. Come on. This is your time. This is your moment. You're in the family room so you can bring your children. They'll remember this. From the foyer, if you're out there and you raised your hand out there, come on into the church service right now. Anybody else, if you need to come, just make your way to the front right now. All right, all right. Hey, everybody up front, take a look up here. Put a big smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. Came to give God all of your heart. Came to give God all of your life. All right? Now, right over here to my right, your left. This is Pastor Joel waving at you, okay? Pastor Joel is a really good guy. Nothing weird is going to go on. I'm going to let you know what he's going to do. He's going to pray with you a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. Then he's going to give you some free stuff, a couple little booklets and some free literature that our pastors wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Then he's going to introduce you to a friend we have here in the church that we like to call a spiritual personal trainer. Heard of a physical trainer at the gym helps you get strong? Spiritual personal trainer will help you to do that spiritually. Okay, he'll describe how it works, and then I'll let you come right back out, okay? Your friends will wait for you. And listen, give us a year of your life here at this church. Promise you at the end of that year, you'll look back and you'll say, wow, I never knew it could be like this. Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right, so if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel right this way, let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.